Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University. And in this video, we are going to look at all sorts of different types of wood connections that are available uh, on the market, including nails, bolts, uh, other types of shear plate connectors, truss plates, timber rivets, glued and rod self-tapping screws, basically the whole gamut. And uh, in this course, we're gonna focus on the technical design of nails and bolts but a lot of the concepts that we'll be covering in terms of those two connection types will uh, also transfer to all those, or at least a lot of those other connection types. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we might wanna consider when we are designing connections in wood. And um, the thing about wood connections is they often end up being the weakest component of the timber structure because a lot of the ways that we connect would uh, engage some of the brittle failure mechanisms that we talked about when we talked about um, wood strength and mechanics in general. Um, so in order to design timber connections that have really high strengths, uh, that can be a challenge. And uh, we'll see in this lecture some of the options for, um, for designing connections that have larger strengths and maybe conventional connections do. Um, and, uh, you know, in fact, for heavy timber connections like ones that you see here, sometimes the entire strength of the member is often governed by the connection instead of the strength of the member itself. Uh, there are a lot of things that we would want to consider, of course, when we're talking about wood connections. Um, cost is probably um, one of the most important, if not the most important, um, in a lot of cases, but also aesthetics are very important. You can see in this figure here, um, these are kind of concealed types of connections where plates are slotted into uh, wood members. So you don't really see the big uh, steel plates that are connecting these together. So there's a lot of ways that we can, we can, um, uh, we can do concealed connections like that. Um, See, so fire is a big consideration. We're not going to talk about that explicitly here. Um, maybe in a shorter lecture in the future. But um, one thing um, that it might be interesting to know at this point is that actually having exposed steel in the connections can be actually something that governs for fire design. So that's another benefit often of using these concealed connections because believe it or not, heavy timber is pretty good in wood because it takes quite a long time to burn through a very uh, big thick timber member. So sometimes concealing the steel plates like shown here actually gives a benefit for fire design as well. Uh, durability and acoustics, uh, we're not going to cover a lot here, but of course strength, stiffness, and ductility are things that we're always interested in. And when we look at designing these timber connections using the um, clauses in the standard, uh, these are going to be our primary considerations. But, um, but of course ease of fabrication is one that is, um, that is uh, maybe kind of a hidden um, consideration that as you get more experience uh, doing wood designs, and maybe having those designs actually come into uh, reality and seeing what happens when uh, these members get fit up in, uh, in practice, um, you probably get more, um, more experience in designing things that are easy to construct. Of course, you know, bolted connections like this are some of the things that are the easiest, easiest to construct. But even with um, some of the other um, maybe more um, some some of the, some of the kind of connections that have come online in the next in the last 10 20 years are ones where ease of ease of fabrication and ease of construction are maybe the primary um, the primary benefit okay so another uh, trend that has happened in the last um, you know maybe last 10 20 years is uh, really the uh, advent of con computer controlled uh, machining for timber members, which allows you to make very precise cuts and, um, um, you know, routings and holes um, that make them, you know, just as easy to fit up as maybe uh, equivalent structural steel members uh, are. And this is kind of a revolution in a sense uh, for timber construction, because if I can use these heavy timber uh, glue lamb or CLT and do all of the holes and slots and fit ups and everything, in the shop before I send them to site, then you get a really huge um, um, fabrication and construction advantage in terms of time. So it's basically just coming with pieces that we know already easily fit together, bringing them to site and just kind of bolting them, bolting them all together. 
and not having to worry too much about the tolerances because with you know machines like this we can get you know probably sub one millimeter tolerance or something like that so very high precision okay so uh basically i'm going to go through and talk about all the different types of connections um we're going to start with nails and i'm going to talk about bolts and all those different things um so you know you're probably already familiar with what a nail is and what a nail looks like um but you also probably know that um Nails are very easy to install, you know, in the, in the limit, you can do it with a, a hand tool, a hammer, uh, often in, uh, in construction, they'll use a pneumatic tool to do the nail installation, but basically nails fit up through friction. Um, you insert the nail and the nail pushes aside the wood fibers. The idea is the nail is going to push aside the wood fibers when I when I nail the nail in and the friction is what keeps that nail um, keeps that nail in place, of course. And so sometimes the profile of the nail will include a, uh, depending on what kind of nail you're using, might have a texture that helps with that friction. But um, the primary way that we load nails is not a pull out like this, but instead um, shear connections like this, where I have something pulling on the member and the nail is held in place um, by friction for lateral, vertical, lateral loads. Um, yeah, so nails come in diameters, you know, up to around four millimeters. There's nails and spikes. Spikes are just nails that are basically bigger. Um, you can get about half a kilonewton to two kilonewton, something on that range of design load per nail. And so that gives you an idea that usually for, uh, for any kind of sizable connection, you're going to use a lot of nails and um, you're going to space them out. But that turns out to be a very good way to do um, wood connections, spacing out the um, spacing out all of the connection elements, which we'll talk about uh, a bit more in a future video. So this is from the wood design, the introduction to wood design book. They have some pictures of nails and what kind of lengths they are in the um, design manual. In the standard, there are actual um, selection tables for nails, which we'll look at when we talk about the details of how to do nailed um, connection designs. But you see we have different shanks, different heads. Spike is the one on the top, Nail regular nail is the one on the bottom. And you can see the difference is just basically in the size. Okay, so the most common place where you're going to see nails like this is uh, in uh, residential construction. Light frame construction is typically done entirely with nails, mostly with nails, with uh, probably a few bolts for hold downs and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, this is a very common way to go about, um, about doing light, light frame construction. But nails can also be used for heavy timber construction. This one is a little bit heavier. You can see the nails. Uh, just right here, bring up my planer. Yeah, so you can see some nails right here that are holding this, uh, this kind of um, purlin or something to this uh, larger beam. Um, and if we have something that, as we mentioned before, if we have quite a lot of force that we need to resist, for example, in this case of this pretty heavy duty hold down that's at the outside of a um, light frame shear wall, uh, we can just use a lot of nails and lay them out in a matrix pattern. And this is an easy way to connect a uh, steel plate to a timber member, as long as we're loading it um, in shear like this. Again, we can't use nails to do loads that are pull out loads because they don't have significant resistance to being pulled out of a member. You can do it with hand tool very easily. Okay, when... Uh, when we connect joists to beams and stuff like that, often we're going to use joist hangers, which we have seen before. These are just members that um, connect between a joist and this one in the back is a larger timber member. And those are uh, almost always also connected with nails, usually using a powered nail gun to um, make installation a little bit easier. Another interesting thing is here, this is a, um, this is a, you know, a wood eye joist. And you can see that you remember that for joists and beams, we're required to provide rotational restraint at the support, top and bottom. Like we're supposed to provide lateral strength, top and bottom at the end of a beam, right? That was one of our requirements when we did beam design. And you can see the way that this joist hanger works. Obviously it can't come inside the flange to connect to the web. So actually uh, you're required to provide a blocking here. <clears throat> 
so that we can have the joist hanger connect to the blocking. And now this blocking with the hanger together prevents the twist that would be possible otherwise with this eye joist. Okay, so the next common thing that you might think for construction would be wood screws, because probably if you ever done anything around your house or anything like that, you know, you might have often used wood screws to put things together. But wood screws are not terribly uh, common for uh, structural design, unless you need something that has a good withdrawal resistance, something that you can actually load and pull out, um, because they tend to be less ductile than nails. And so nails can bend and bend um, and dissipate energy through inelastic bending over and over and take quite a few cycles back and forth. Um, whereas the way that screws are manufactured makes them um, kind of considerably less, typically less ductile. And so we don't usually use um, screws, for example, to um, make uh, light frame shear walls. Okay, although you might think it's a good idea because, you know, you'd say, well, a screw is going to hold in better than a nail, so we should probably use a screw. But one of the primary things that we need to do is in the shear behavior, the, um, the sheathing connected to the studs, they need to move kind of laterally to each other when the wall deforms. And um, screws are not so good for that because they don't have that kind of inelastic capacity in, in that kind of shear movement. But they are very good if you need something that um, needs to um, have a withdrawal strength. It also takes a longer time to install them than nails, right? So if I have uh, nails with a pneumatic uh, pneumatic gun, then they're very easy to install. Screws take a bit longer because you have to wait for it to screw in, obviously. Uh, you know, it might not be very long on the scale of one or the other if we're just doing one, but, you know, over the time of installing hundreds or thousands of these, it's going to lead to a significant difference. Uh, about the same strength as screws. Um, you don't need to pre-drill usually for, usually for um, screws like this. Um, but as I, as I said, the, the difference is that screws can tend to be um, pretty brittle. So they don't, uh, they don't have as much um, inelastic bending capacity. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the next one that we're going to talk about in this course, and we're going to learn all about designing these kind of connections, is for bolts and dowels. Like I have a little bolt right here. And um, so bolts are a really common way to make wood connections. We've seen a lot of pictures of wood connections that use bolts, um, either connecting wood members to other members with bolts or connecting wood members to steel plates with bolts. Um, you might see them in diameters, you know, for wood applications. Usually you're going to be using something on the order of a half inch or three quarter inch. Um, you could potentially see up to one inch for really big members. Um, like that would be a pretty large bolt to use. That's kind of the larger bolt that you use for steel design, right? Is a one inch diameter bolt, um, could be up to an inch and a half, but, uh, that would not be very common. I mean, for smaller timber connections, a half inch bolt that looks something like this is, um, probably a common type of, uh, common type of bolt that you would see. So. Each bolt can transfer quite a bit can transfer quite a bit more lateral strength than a single nail, right? You can get up to, you know, maybe thirty kilonewtons per bolt, something like that. But unlike nails, nails I can just kind of drive in and fit it in between the fibers like that. For bolts, we are going to have to cut a hole first. We can't just obviously push a bolt through uh, a piece of wood; it's too big, can't fit between the fibers. So we're going to have to pre-drill for bolts. <clears throat> that pre-drill hole is going to be a little bit bigger than the bolt typically, if we're talking about bolts. Um, and that helps with fit up, obviously. But, um, you know, in, in, in traditional heavy timber construction, bolt is the way. You know, now these days we're going to talk about a lot of different options for heavy timber construction um, that don't use bolts. But bolts are kind of the classic and, uh, you know, still very much uh, popular and in use. Um, in terms of ductility, bolts can uh, provide some ductility, but it really depends on the size of the bolt. And when we talk about bolt design, we're going to talk about all the different ways that um, bolted timber connections can fail. A ductile way is one of them, and that is a desirable failure mechanism, basically where the bolt, um, where the bolt bends inelastically, it bends permanently. 
and that dissipates some energy. And uh, that is a ductile um, type of failure mechanism. But it really depends on my geometry of the bolt and the geometry of the members, whether I'm going to get a ductile failure mode or not. So often with bolts, um, we generally with larger bolts, we're going to be likely to get some kind of brittle failure mechanism in our connection, which means a failure mechanism, basically that's going to generate some kind of cracking in the wood and uh, basically instantaneous failure after the cracking. Uh, so those are, the, those are pictures of bolts by themselves. This is a picture of some kind of bolted connections, but these use dowels instead of bolts. And the only difference between a dowel and a bolt, I mean, they work the same way. The design is the same. All the design equations are the same for dowels and bolts. But the difference is for bolts, I'm going to cut a hole that's bigger than the bolt, and then I'm going to fit up the bolt inside. The bolt is then going to be held in place using a nut. Right, like I've got my nut here. That's sorry, those are the washers. I've got my nut here. My nut is going to thread on the bolt, and that's what's going to hold the connection together. Okay. In the case of dowels, um, for a dowel, I basically cut my hole the same size as the dowel. The dowel does not have a head. It does not have a dot, a, a nut. The hole is cut like basically just a little bit smaller so that it fits in with friction. So in order to install a dowel. I'm going to have to uh, use a hammer or something to force the dowel um, into the hole. And since the dowel and the hole, like maybe the hole is just a little bit smaller than the dowel, they're about the same size, the friction fit between the two is going to keep that dowel in place. But uh, from the point of view of, des of design, uh, it's basically the same. So we design dowels the same way that we're going to design bolts. Dowel is just basically a, a steel rod. Okay, so there's all sorts of different ways that I can do bolted connections. I have a bunch of examples, um, and this is the way that we refer to them. Actually, we'll refer to you know wood steel connection, steel uh, steel wood steel connection, wood 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 connection. Basically, what we're talking about is just the order that the members are connected. So this connection over here, if you're from Ottawa, you probably recognize what this uh, what particular store this might be. If we look here, what we have is three members connected together. One, two, three. And so that would be a wood, wood, wood connection. And these long bolts go all the way through um, all three members. So that's a wood, wood, wood connection. You can see that we have kind of a bit of a problem with this connection um, to do with shrinkage. You can see these cracks. We have a crack at the center of this member. We have a crack at the center of this member. And this is due to differential shrinkage. So remember that timber wood shrinks much more in the perpendicular to grain direction than it does in the parallel to grain direction, right? So let's assume for now that, I mean, it's more than an order of magnitude less in the parallel to grain direction, right? So let's assume, let's say that the parallel to grain direction was uh, zero for the sake of argument. Let's say it didn't shrink and only this dimension shrinks, shrinks across the perpendicular to grain direction because that one is much, much more. Okay, so let's say that I have these two wood members connected together. And this is a problem also in steel connections. OK, I have these two wood members connected together. And um, this one in the back does not want to shrink in this direction. OK, so along this entire length, it doesn't shrink. Not very much, very small amount because it's longitudinal grain shrinkage. But this member does want to shrink. If I put two bolts here connecting these two members, this wood member wants to shrink if it gets dry and it wants to expand if it gets wet, right? So moisture content is going to cause this to shrink and expand. Now the one behind, which the bolts also go through, does not want to shrink and expand in that direction, right? So the one at the bolt is going to hold those, the, sorry, the one at the back is going to hold those bolts in place while the one in the front is going to try to shrink. And so as the one in the front tries to shrink, we're going to get a tension stress in between the two bolts and that tension stress is going to create a crack in the middle you know if those two are too far apart for example okay you know the bolt holes themselves can accommodate a little bit of that but only up to a certain point right so here you know these are pretty big members we have two bolts like this and so as the the front member wants to shrink in this direction the back member does not allow the bolts to move in that direction which means the bolts stay in place and the member shrinks between them which creates a tension stress, which causes a crack. In the same sense, if I had two bolts in this direction, 
then this member will not allow shrinkage but the back member will want to shrink, so the back member would also crack. So you can imagine if I have a matrix of four holes here with four bolts, one, two, three, four, then I'll get crack in the front member in this direction, I'll get a crack in the back member in this direction, which is exactly what we see here. So that's just a bit of a um, example, a real life example of when shrinkage can cause a problem for us. Okay, here's another example of a wood, wood, wood connection. I'm talking about the connection up here or down here. Okay, so here we just have two. Um, we don't have a big um, problem in this case. Um, the glue lamp member is gonna shrink probably a bit less than the uh, timber member. The other thing that you will notice here that I wanna point out while I have this picture up is this flashing. You see this steel flashing on top or, or you know, it might be aluminum flashing. I don't know what it is. Uh, with a little lip. It has a little lip on the edge that's very uh, difficult to see. But the point of this is to keep, is to, when water falls on top of this, to shed the water off. Especially important on this front face because this is the end grain of the member. As we learned about when we talked about um, moisture in wood, it's much easier for moisture to um, go into the wood from the end grain where we have all of the open holes of the straws than it is for the water to get in on the side grain, which is kind of the side of the fibers, the side of the straws, if we're thinking about wood fibers as straws. So it's important to keep this face um, dry as much as possible if we want to keep our wood member dry. Um, you'll see we have the same kind of thing over here where we have a vertical column and on top it is capped with some steel flashing to keep the top from um, getting too wet. So if we have wood members outside, it's a good idea to try to keep them dry as much as possible. Here's an example of a wood steel wood connection. So here we have a steel plate. There's a steel knife plate in here. We call that a knife plate because it's kind of like, it looks like it's kind of cutting the, cutting the wood member. So I have my wood member like this and I cut a slot. I cut a slot here and I insert my steel, my steel plate you know, into the slot. Wow, this actually does kind of have a slot. So it's like I'm putting the steel plate in the slot like that. That's a knife plate connection. Um, here we basically would design this as two separate wood, steel, wood connections. I'd have the one on the left, wood, steel, wood. Then I have the one on the right, wood, steel, wood. It tells you how to design that in the standard. Um, yeah, so the nice thing about this connection is it's nice and hidden. So you don't actually see the steel plates, um, except for this one here that joins them together. So it's a very attractive kind of um, type of connection. And then you can see that that steel plate is held in using bolts. And in this case, the bolts aren't all installed yet. You can see there's some holes. This is a kind of under construction picture. Here's another example of a wood steel wood. So you can see there's kind of a brown steel plate here. You can see an example of some where we haven't had uh, members installed yet. And this wood member has a slot this big glue lamp piece has a slot and the steel plate goes in the slot. And so we're basically using the steel plate as a proxy to connect the different pieces of wood together. This is a really neat, here's another picture from the same building, uh, which has these lovely trees. I think this is maybe in Mississauga. And um, you can actually see a, a kind of dowel or drift pin here. So the steel connection here is attached to the side of this with nails. And then um, the piece that's going to go on here that's not there yet is going to have a slot to accept this piece of steel. And then it's gonna be held in place with bolts or dowels. Okay, this is another wood steel wood. Here you don't see any steel at all, but you can tell there must be something in between these because these wood members are not slotted into each other. There's no mortise tenon joint or anything like that. So there's a steel, a hidden steel plate in here, and these bolts connect the, um, there's, a, there's a steel plate that is in all three of these at once, and then the bolts hold the steel, the steel plate in place. The opposite of the wood steel wood connection is the steel wood steel connection. So this is basically, we have steel on the outside, the wood members on the inside, and then you'll have a identical steel member on the other side, which you can't see here, but so there's steel, wood, then steel on the other side. It's just basically clamping two pieces of wood together with steel plates. 
and then bolting those steel plates through the three, through the, through bolting those steel plates to the wood using bolts going through all three. This can be very attractive, especially, you know, you see a lot of pictures of the kind of nice wood with kind of black colored steel plates makes a nice contrast. It can be very nice. Okay, another application for bolts is hold down connections. So this would be, for example, I'm connecting steel to a piece of wood directly. So that would be like steel wood. Or if I had it like this, it would be steel wood with a bolt in between the two. I think there's a close up here. But before I get to that close up, you can see for light frame shear walls, as we talked about before, we need to have hold downs. The hold downs keep the wall from rocking. Because if I have my wall here and I push on the wall, it's going to want to rock up. So I have to hold it down at the both opposite corners. And so I can use a bracket and then uh, the bracket will be connected to the foundation at the bottom or in upper levels. You'll see that we connect one bracket on one floor to a identical bracket on the next floor. And, you know, it might look something like this. We just saw an example of this where the steel angle was nailed to the um, to the cords of the wall, um, but we could also use bolts instead. So here's an example where I have a steel to wood connection. So that's a steel wood connection. And then of course at the bottom, this is held down either, you know, potentially using a bolt probably either to the floor below or to uh, the foundation. Okay, so bolts we're gonna spend a lot more time on um, in future um, lectures. Um, but for now, we're going to go over some of the other things that we're not going to cover in future lectures. So just so you know that they exist. And uh, one of those is lag screws. So lag screws are not like regular wood screws. They're more similar to bolts, except they don't have a nut. Okay, so they're kind of a cross between screws and bolts. The uh, resistance, uh, like the, the, the mechanism for resisting lateral load, on a connection interface is similar to how it is for bolts, um, except these can have a very high withdrawal strength. So it means if I have a lag screw, like if there's a lag screw and not a bolt, and I screw that into the piece of wood, and then I have something that is providing a load like this that wants to pull the lag screw out, it has a very high resistance to that withdrawal force. Um, usually you don't have to pre-drill to install these, but you might need a lead hole, which means basically you, dr you drill like a pilot hole just to make sure that when you put in the screw, it doesn't kind of divert off to the side as you're putting it in. And these have uh, diameters similar to diameters of um, available bolts. Yeah. So if you only have access to one face and not the other, like if, if this is something that's really thick and I don't want to go all the way through it, like let's say it's this thick and I want to connect something to the side, but I don't want to have something that goes all the way through, then a good option would be potentially to use a lag bolt, a lag screw. I mean, I think also called a lag bolt um, for that. I have some examples of what that looks like. So, so here's an example where a, a lag screw is connecting a steel plate to a uh, timber member. So you can see, you know, you would make a lead hole that would be as long as this, and then you would um, potentially provide a counter bore because the entire shank you can see is not, um, you can notice that the entire shank of this does not have a thread. There's some part that does not. This is the part that's supposed to be intercepted at the interface, right? So you can see there's a shear interface here between the steel bolt and the wood. One is gonna move relative to the other, obviously, is the whole idea of this connection. So let me show it so that you can see the steel side. The steel is gonna to wanna to move relative to this, and that's why I'm putting the bolt here, right? Is to prevent these two from moving relative to the other. But at the point where they are adjacent, like where they're touching each other, that's called the shear plane. And um, it's much better if I am, if I have a bolt here, that I want that shear plane not to go through the threads because the bolt is much weaker at the threads. So if this is where my primary resistance of the bolt is, like this is where the bolt is taking the shear load, the shear between the plate and the timber, then here I wanna have, uh, you know, a, as big of a, 
diameter as possible. So that's why they'll leave some space here that does not have threads because it's going to be much stronger here without the threads. Um, yeah, the rest of these are just some definitions that we don't really need to worry about. But anyway, we're going to penetrate that uh, certain distance into the, um, the timber member that lag screw. So here's an example. This is from the Richmond um, Oval that we've seen a picture of the inside before, which has really big curved glue lamb beams. Uh, on the outside, there are these um, diagonal braces and these diagonal braces at the end are connected to a big solid steel um, pin connection. You can see the pin here uh, using lag bolts, which are um, are threaded through uh, at the end of the member. So basically we're penetrating into the end grain of the member here. So it's nice, it's kind of, uh, you know, it looks pretty hidden. So we couldn't do this with a bolt, obviously, because where would we put the nut, right? So screw is, a, is one way to do this. Okay, truss plates are used a lot for light frame construction, and they're called truss plates because they're usually used to uh, put together truss, trusses, like big um, um, light frame trusses. So you can see here, I'm gonna go back to that one in a minute, um, you know, you can see here some roof trusses and the trusses are connected by these truss plates. The advantage of these truss plates is they're super easy to install because basically what I can do is I can lay out all of my truss members on the ground, like horizontally, lay them all out, put these truss plates on top and on the bottom. So one underneath and one on top at each intersection point of the diagonal members and the cords of the truss. And then if I have a big press, I can basically press the whole thing together at once and install all of the truss plates. So I just lay it out. I put these truss plates. These truss plates are basically just light gauge steel with some spikes punched out of them. So it's like I start with my steel plate and I punch out um, a coupon of the plate to make a little spike. And then, uh, I mean, obviously I buy, I don't do that. I'll buy it off the, off the shelf. And then I can just lay everything out and then just smush it all together and make a like a prefab truss and so that's what it might look like in practice these are some these are pretty heavy ones for uh, you know this is a pretty heavy application of truss plate like maybe a lighter you know two by material is um, maybe even more common <clears throat> okay this is something else that's in the standard that we're not going to talk about in a lot of detail but i just want to make you aware because it does have some good um, potential applications is called a split ring. You can see it's a ring of steel and the split is just that the steel is not um, connected all the way around. There is a, um, there's a disconnection here. So this split ring can actually open up and close up a bit. And that allows some flexibility on the size of the cavity that I install it in as we're gonna see in a second. So here's what we do, we take a piece of wood we um, uh, drill out this groove and that groove is half in one piece of wood and half in the next piece of wood. So I have a piece of wood, I have a second piece of wood. I'm gonna, drill, I'm gonna take a groove out of this one and I'm gonna take a groove out of this one as well. That's the size of the split ring. So the split ring is gonna sit half in one and half in the other and then I'm gonna put them together and now that split ring is gonna provide a connection between the two that has a very high resistance per split ring because I'm engaging a much larger uh, area of this piece of wood. Then I have a bolt that goes through the middle and the idea of that bolt is just to hold the two pieces of wood together. So the shear resistance, the movement between these two pieces of wood is provided by the ring and the bolt just keeps the ring in place basically, keeps it from um, um, keeps it keeps it seated properly in the two pieces of wood. Here's a better kind of color picture. You can see the split of the ring here um, is um, like the ring is opened a little bit, so it has some friction as it goes in because there's going to be kind of a spring force wanting to close it, um, so it can properly fit in that groove. And then there's a bolt. You know, this is a cutaway. Obviously, we would never have it like this. Um, this piece of wood should continue and then this bolt keeps the two pieces of wood together so that it can engage the split ring. So that's kind of what the tool looks like. So you can drill the hole and make the groove at the same time. <clears throat> and here you can see the cross section where I have the ring in between two pieces of wood and the ring goes half into one and half into the other. 
and the bolt holds it together. And you can learn how to design these types of connections in the standard. We're not going to cover it in this course. Uh, another similar kind of connection is called a shear plate. It uses the same kind of idea of having a ring, but in this case, the um, the the ring does not go into both pieces of wood simultaneously. Basically, instead of having one ring that's common to both pieces of wood, I'll have one ring that's installed in one piece, a separate ring that's installed in the other, and a bolt that will go through the middle. Now, in this case, the bolt does double duty. It doesn't have to keep the rings in place, but what it does do is it basically, now the bolt is providing the shear. Okay, and what this does is it makes sure that the, um, the mechanism for failure is now going to be the shear yielding of the bolt. That's the idea, okay, which is a better ductile shear failure than um, a lot of the failures that we can get with bolted connections, which involve basically causing splits in the piece of wood and having the bolt be pulled out or, um, or uh, crushing the wood, basically. So it's a similar kind of pro process in that we want to have a tool that cuts the hole for the bolt and also prepares the surface of the wood to accept the shear plate. And so here you can see the shear plate goes right into that piece of wood and then the surface of that plate is flush then with the piece of wood. Okay, and then I can either do, you know, I can use that to connect steel to the piece of wood or I could use that kind of connection with two shear plates to join um, two pieces of wood together. With the um, split ring, I can only connect two pieces of wood, right? Because the split ring has to be half in one piece of wood and half in the other. So that's not something that I would have any reason to do with steel. But for a shear plate, I can use a shear plate to connect a piece of wood to a piece of steel. So it's basically increasing the strength. Uh, it's increasing the um, the strength that can be that can be used with one bolt in a connection, because we're basically preventing that bolt from causing splitting and bearing failures in the wood. Um, so we're more uh, efficiently engaging the strength of that bolt, basically, is what we're doing when we use a shear plate. Okay, timber rivets are a really interesting one. So this is something that was actually um, in, uh, invented in Canada, timber rivets in the 60s. And they're like nails, but they have a flat cross section. So it doesn't have a round circular cross section like a nail does it has kind of an elongated cross section. And the reason for that is it's gonna do a better job of getting in between those fibers. So if I have um, my fibers like this and I wanna put a nail, let's say this is a nail and not a bolt, okay? I'm just using it because it has a round cross section. So let's say I have a bolt, uh, sorry, let's say I have a nail. The nail has a round cross section and I put the nail into my uh, fibers um, you know, I have to push those fibers quite a bit apart, right? Like I have to separate them pretty far. And some of them are going to get crushed. Like I'm not totally going to be able to separate those fibers apart when I put the nail in. Obviously, always I'm going to damage some fibers when I do this process. But really, the more that I can spread the fibers apart and stick the fastener in between them, the better, because then I get a really high friction in between the two. Okay, so if I use a round one, it's going to be a bit more difficult. If I were to use something flatter, you know, let's say I have a flat, this is just a quarter, let's say I have a flat cross section, then I can fit it more easily in between those fibers, um, which means I don't have to push those fibers so far apart. But that does mean that if I'm installing timber rivets, which have a cross section that's kind of flat, I have to install them so that the long part of the cross section is in the direction of the fibers. If I install it like this, if I install it like this, you know, that really defeats the purpose because now I have to cut through all of those fibers basically in order to fit this in. Okay, so I need to, I need to install it so that the flat part is in the same direction as the, um, as the fibers of the piece of wood. Okay, but then, uh, this is a really good way to connect a steel plate to a piece of wood. Um, so it's a simple tool to install them, just like for nails, and um, very strong. It, it has a higher load transfer per fastener than nails do, because I'm not so much damaging the um, damaging the surface or damaging the fibers as I install them. So you can see this is a tool used to install these timber rivets. 
these rivets, you can see a little bit how the head is elongated in one direction. And these ones are lined up with the grain in this piece of material. These ones are lined up with the grain in this piece, and these ones here are lined up with the grain in this piece when they're installed. You know, and this can look very attractive. Um, we have some pieces of steel holding these big um, diagonal bracing members together and timber rivets connecting the steel to the, to the uh, wood. And you use a lot of them and, um, you know, you spread it out over a large area and you can get a, a nice high um, um, resistance. A lot of teeth. Here you can see a bit better. Um, these timber rivets have the long dimension vertical and these timber rivets have the long direction of the cross section horizontal. Yeah, so here you can see um, what that would look like in um, a schematic form. So the hole in the steel plate will have, the steel plate will still have a round hole and this head of the timber will kind of wedge into that hole. So it will also keep, uh, it will also reduce kind of the, um, it'll eliminate the space between the nail and the hole, right? Like if I use a nail in a steel plate and the nail goes through a hole in the steel plate, that hole is going to have to obviously be a bit bigger than the nail. So then the nail, the plate can move around a little bit because there's going to be potentially a little gap. So that's not the case with timber rivets because timber rivet has a wedge that goes into the hole. So as I drive the timber rivet in, it wedges against the side of the hole, which means that the hole can't move. <clears throat> okay, so timber rivets kind of like a um, high performance connector developed quite a long time ago. Something that is really in vogue now is called um, self tapping screws. And uh, they're basically screws, but they're really long. And um, the self tapping part is that they, um, they basically have to drill their own hole as the nail goes in. Um, so these are always kind of a proprietary. There's no standard kind of screwed in self-tapping screw fastener. Depends on which manufacturer you get it from. Um, they tend to be very long like this. They have a really high yield strength, um, maybe around, you know, 800 MPA, something like that. Um, so we don't typically have to pre-drill when we install these. Uh, we have done these in the lab and um, we have dr drilled pilot holes, certainly. Um, for some of the bigger ones, you might have to pre-drill a portion of the depth. So we've run into that before. But you can see all of the different kind of profiles you can get, and you can get them with different kind of heads. You know, this one kind of has a machine bolt head. This one has, uh, you know, like a tapered head. This one has a flat kind of head. And uh, you just install them with a regular drill. I mean, the drill typically has to have a bit more torque than the drill that you have maybe in your basement for fixing drywall and stuff like that. But you can get them in all sorts of sizes. You know, they come up to, you know, half inch diameter, which is pretty big. I mean, this is half inch diameter. Um, and they come really long and like you can get them like a meter long. And these are really useful for connecting um, heavy timber members, especially has a lot of application in connections of CLT. Um, so, you know, this has become a very popular choice these days for doing heavy timber connections. Um, I wanted to show you an example from our own work uh, at the university. This is from uh, some research that we did a number of years ago, looking at connecting steel moment, um, moment yielding connections to timber beams. And um, one thing that you can do with these self-tapping screws is if you install them on an angle, you can uh, really increase the lateral resistance and stiffness uh, by quite a bit because now you're engaging it. Not only are you engaging it in shear, but you're also you're engaging it in shear and in tension simultaneously. And these have a really good withdrawal resistance because of the spiral on the shank. Um, so here we had some, you know, we ordered these and we could order these kind of special washers that allow us to install them at a 45 degree directly. Now, um, you know, if you uh, sit and think about this connection for a little while, you understand that when I'm pulling on this, it's going to create a tension perpendicular to grain stress in the middle. 
And so we also looked at, and this came up in a previous live session, um, uh, for these kind of connections, we installed some additional self-tapping screws. These vertical lines are long self-tapping screws. We installed them vertically throughout the connection to reinforce for tension perpendicular to grain stress. So it's kind of holding the piece of wood together so it avoids splitting. And uh, this all worked very well. So we had this uh, steel connection here. This is a steel um, yielding W section, like an I-beam. Um, this is meant for high performance buildings where we want to have basically a steel moment frame, but we want the rest of the building to be done in wood. This was our idea. So here you can see uh, my former student installing these um, self-tapping screws. So there's the special washer. This is like a jig for installing it. And um, oh, this is the jig for pre-drilling. So he's doing a, a short pre-drilling hole here in order to make a good um, angle when he actually puts the screw in. And then you can see here, he's using a drill. This is not a very big drill to install the self-tapping screw. And this is what it looks like after it's installed. So here, these are the ones that are waiting to be installed still. Um, yeah, the only tricky bit was we had to have these slotted holes machined in this plate, which is not such a big deal nowadays because um, machining these kind of slotted holes and stuff is uh, not so difficult to do with CNC equipment. Uh, this is what the final connection looked like. So you can see this basically represents a timber column. This is a timber beam. And in the middle here, we have our yielding section. So this is a steel I-beam that's going to yield in moment. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if this is the first time, but it might be the first time that maybe someone has designed a connection um, for wood where we can basically yield the steel. We can totally destroy this pretty big sizable steel connection. Um, using wood members to provide the load. So here, the load is applied out here directly to the wood and the resistance is out here applied directly to the wood. So basically the wood member here is yielding the steel member and the wood member remains undamaged. That was kind of the goal of our research study. Another type of connection that's um, uh, becoming popular and uh, you know a lot of research has been done on is called glued in rods. And this is, a connection where you take basically a um, threaded rod, threaded steel rod, and you drill a kind of large hole in the wood member and you put the threaded rod into the hole and you fill all the space here with epoxy, which is a type of glue. And that's why it's called glued in rods. So we basically, it's, it's not very complicated. You take a rod and you glue it in and then you make a glued in rod. And uh, these is, this is just showing the different kind of failure mechanisms that you can have with these glued-in rods. You know, I can have failure of the, of the uh, rod uh, in yielding. I can have failure of the net section of the piece of wood. I can fail in the wood. I can fail in the glue. Or I can get this kind of splitting failure. I mean, this is not terribly important to our discussion here. But here you can see on the right some examples of some uh, ones that we did in the lab where we installed some rods and um, we filled it with epoxy and then we tested these connections. Um, since there is no current Canadian standard for um, directly designing these glued in rod connections, but there are a number that come from Europe, which is what we relied on when doing our design. So here you can see the process. Th this is for a bigger, um, you know, these ones were individual ones we just did for test connections. This is one that we did for a, um, an actual big structural connection that we were testing where we wanted to install um, diagonal steel cross braces in a wood building. And you can see here the process of injecting this epoxy. And this is a two part epoxy. So basically it comes in two different, uh, it comes in two different containers and you put them all into like this, what's effectively a big caulking gun. And then in the nozzle here, the two chemicals mix and when they mix, that's when they'll start to um, they'll start to set. So we mix the two part epoxy, we inject it into the holes, and we install the rods. So then we, we fill it with epoxy, and then we install these rods. You can see the the remainder kind of comes at the top. So we try to make sure we get the right amount of epoxy in there, and uh, we try to line them up straight and so on. Here you can see some of my former students doing this. These guys are all, you know, big shots now. <laughs> this fellow in the back, he's a professor at uh, Queen's University now. These guys are both doing um, structural design at firms in Toronto and Vancouver. Um, 
And uh, these are the specimens after we filled in the rods. You can see all these things on top are just to try to keep the rods straight because we're doing lab research. So we're trying to get them kind of as perfect as possible. And then after that, we had used these rods basically to connect these steel members to the ends of these large pieces of glue lamb. So here we have glue lamb column, glue lamb beam. All the steel plates are connected to those using glued in rods. So you can see like the connection looks very clean and neat. So I don't have to go up the side of this glue lamb member at all with a big steel plate, you know, like I did in the in the screwed connection. So here I have these end uh, glued in rods that um, that are, are providing the reaction here and um, providing this intermediate brace connection where we we're, 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 our goal here was to test like an advanced earthquake brace, um, how, how we could practically install that into a heavy timber building. Um, so we used some some small amounts of steel select locations in order to uh, in order to do that and we instrumented all these um all these interfaces to see how those glued in rod connections were um faring which was very very good yeah actually much better than i even thought okay so those are all of the different types of connections that i just wanted to introduce you to going forward we're going to learn specifically how to design nailed connections and bolted connections since these are kind of the most common typical connections um, you know, glued in rods and self-tapping screws are not really in the design guideline. Um, there are some proprietary methods and stuff to design those types of connections. I mean, it's come a long way, certainly in the past five, 10 years, even since we did that study, I think it's come quite a long way. Um, but I think that, you know, the idea in this course is if we can understand the failure mechanisms for uh, nails and we can understand the failure mechanisms for both those kind of uh, that kind of mechanics understanding is going to transfer well to all the other types of connections that you might run into in practice. So that as long as you understand the mechanics of what's happening in the wood, um, you can learn how to um, uh, figure out any type of connection. So uh, that's the end of this video uh, where we learned how to design all these, or not to design, but we learned about all these different types of connections. And uh, following up this, we're going to talk about um, different pitfalls that we want to avoid when we're designing connections.